Hello. Um, you are a fantastic audience. Um, all the authors have been saying that backstage. Uh, you're attentive and, you know, polite, and you haven't heckled. Not once. Uh, and it's probably a bit late now, because it's almost the end of the evening, but you are welcome to heckle. Okay? No, really, you are. Um, your reticence is, 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 is wise, though, because heckling is... A, is Thank you very much. There you go. <laughs> See, this proves my point. Heckling is a fine art. Uh, I worked for a number of years as a, as, as a stand-up, and, and these are a couple of the heckles that I have, I have witnessed, my hand to God, and your heckles have got to be this good. I once saw a comic come on stage at the Comedy Store uh, in London, and for reasons best known unto himself, decided to spend the first five minutes of his act miming. I've no, I've no idea why I thought this was clever, but for five minutes, not a word. He's walking against the wind, he's trapped in a box, not a word, until after about five minutes, a man stood up at the back of the room and went, Oi, speak up, I'm blind. Um, and it was brilliant, it was a two-part heckle. The heckler waited a couple of minutes and then went, has he gone yet? Um, I, I, was, um, I was once on a bill with a stage hypnotist. You know those guys that makes people cluck like a chicken and eat onions and stuff? And he came out and he was very pompous. And he said, listen, I'm a proper stage hypnotist. This is not cheap theatrics. There's no shenanigans. Uh, let me just make it clear. Have I ever met or worked with anybody in this room at all? And they all went, no. And there was a beat. And then a man went, master. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the comedian Al Murray once came on stage and went, good evening, I'm a schizophrenic. And a bloke went, well, the pair of you can piss off then. Um, <laughs> So that's how good your heckles have got to be. Um, it is really fantastic to be part of, of a fantastic day. And one of the best things about it is what is being given out to a million readers today is one of these, a book. Not a download, not a hyperlink, an actual physical thing. Um, and to all those who talk about the death of the book and the inexorable rise of cutting edge technology, I would just say that as cutting edge technology goes, this thing is pretty bloody nifty. Uh, and it doesn't run out of batteries. Um, <laughs> It's been around in pretty much the same design for 500 years, and it's going nowhere. Um, I would like to read you something funny and joyous and uplifting. I would like to, um, but, but my books aren't like that. Um, this is an excerpt from Sleepyhead. Friday, June 15th, 1985, nearly going home time. It's a big one, the biggest since the Ripper. 15,000 interviews in 18 months, and they've got nothing. The press are going mental, but not that mental, obviously. It's not like he's killing women or straight blokes after all. Just the right amount of moral outrage and the odd comment about the risks inherent in that kind of lifestyle. No lurid nickname, though if the sun could have got away with Puff Killer, they would certainly have used it. Just Johnny Boy. The fourth victim had told a friend he was meeting a man called John for a drink. This was an hour or so before he had his heart cut out and his genitals removed. Now an approximation of what might be Johnny Boy's face stares down from the wall of every nick in the country. He's got dirty blonde hair and a sallow complexion. His eyes are blue and very, very cold. Detective Constable Thomas Thorne leans against the wall of the interview room at Paddington Station and stares at a man with dirty blonde hair and blue eyes. Francis John Calvert, 34, a self-employed builder from North London. Any chance of a fag? I'm gasping. Calvert smiles, a winning smile. Thorne says nothing, just watching him until D.I. Duffy comes back. Surely I'm allowed one poxy fag. Then the door opens. Duffy comes back in and the interview resumes. None of it is riveting stuff. It's purely routine anyway. Calvert's only there because of what he does. A week before he died, the second victim told a flatmate he'd met a man in a club who said he was a builder. The flatmate made a joke about toolkits and builder's bum crack. Seven days and one body later and the joke wasn't funny anymore, but the flatmate remembered what his dead friend had said. Thousands of builders to be interviewed, so Calvert gets the phone call and comes into Paddington for a chat. Duffy gives Calvert his fag. He wants to get home. Thorne wants to get home too. He's been married less than a year. He's only got one ear on the answers. Calvert reels off at home with his wife. Wishes he could go out gallivanting. Not to those sorts of places, obviously. He hopes they find this nutter and string him up. It doesn't matter what these purrs get up to in their private life. What this bloke's doing is disgusting. Duffy hands Calvert the short statement to sign, and that's that. Another one crossed off the list. He thanks him. Thorne holds the door open and Calvert steps out into the corridor. He strolls casually past more interview rooms, hands in pockets, whistling. Thorne can hear a distant radio. 
playing one of his favorite songs, There Must Be an Angel by the Eurythmics. Jan bought the record for him last week. He thinks about dinner. Maybe he can go and get a takeaway. Through the first set of swing doors and left, along another corridor which sweeps round towards main reception. Calvert waits, allowing Thorne to catch him up. He holds the doors for him. Bet you lot are making a mint in overtime. Thorne says nothing. He can't wait to see the back of the cocky little bastard. Past another Johnny Boy poster, somebody's drawn a speech bubble. It says, hello, sailor. Thorne's humming the Eurythmic song as he walks. He steps ahead of Calvert and pushes open the final set of doors. This is as far as he goes. Calvert steps through the doors, stops and turns. Cheers then. Thorne is looking towards the desk sergeant when he feels the large calloused hand take his and turns to look at Francis John Calvert and everything changes. It isn't the resemblance to the photo fit. He'd registered that the instant he'd clapped eyes on Calvert and forgotten it again moments later. It isn't the resemblance, but it is the face. Thorne looks at Calvert's face and knows. It lasts no more than a second or two, but it's enough. He can see through to what lies behind those deep blue eyes, and what he sees terrifies him. He sees boozing, yes, and football on a Saturday and wolf whistles with the lads, and an incandescent rage, barely kept in check inside the cosy conformity of a loveless, sexless marriage. He sees something deep and dark and rotting, something fetid, spilling into the earth and bubbling with blood. He can't explain it, but he knows beyond a shadow of the smallest doubt that the man in front of him, the man shaking his hand, is responsible for stalking and slaughtering half a dozen gay men in the last year and a half. Then he sees the most terrifying thing of all. Calvert knows that he knows. Thorne thinks his face is frozen, expressionless, but obviously he's wrong. He can see the change in Calvert's eyes as they meet his own, just a slight flicker, the tiniest twitch, and the smile that is beginning to die a little. Then it's over. The grip is released, and Calvert is moving away through the lobby towards the main station doors. He stops for a second and turns, and now the smile is gone completely. The look Thorne sees on his face is something like fear. And somewhere in the distance, a sweet, high voice is still singing about imaginary angels. Thanks very much. Have a great evening. <laughs>